Hello everyone. Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale, and we're trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. What's something uh, that's exciting and attracting your attention this week, Harlan? Well, it's, it's hard not to pay attention to this big change that's occurring at the NIH. Uh, just this week, Francis Collins announced his retirement from the position of directorship of the NIH. Uh, here's a guy who's served for 12 years under three presidents and done with remarkable distinction. I, I've had the pleasure of working with Francis in many different venues. I, we were on the Board of Governors together at PCORI. I was on the um, advisory committee to the director for many years with him. And I, I just saw a person who was truly remarkable, someone really dedicated to science and public service, uh, really a model of integrity and humanity. He, he stood up for diversity within the NIH. He stood up for women, for young investigators. He tried to right some wrongs by the way he worked with the Lax family to, to make sure that the NIH did right by them. He was able to translate complex concepts into really understandable nuggets that he was able to convey to the public. He was a terrific advocate on Capitol Hill. Anyway, I, you can see I'm a big fan. You know, it's an exciting moment in science. Uh, we've gotten a lot of progress quickly in the pandemic, and I think that's gotten people excited about the prospect for other diseases. NIH, uh, Francis leaves it in good shape, but, but it's still, it's at a moment in time where there's likely to be a lot of change. And so I think we should all be watching carefully who, who's nominated and what direction might they bring them. But we're, we're unlikely to get someone quite as, quite as able to communicate across the aisle. Look, anyone who was nominated by Biden, Trump, and Obama uh, is a special individual. He bridged faith and science. He's a man of deep faith. His, I recommend his books. They're really quite interesting, and uh, we'll see what happens next. But uh, it's been a, quite a ride, I think, having him at the helm of, of NIH. And what about you, Howie? What's on your mind? We are blessed to have a huge nurse practitioner uh, market, so to speak, in the United States right now. We're, um, we're seeing about, I think, about 35,000 new uh, nurse practitioners completing their programs each year. There are about 325,000 nurse practitioners in the United States right now. And we are fast approaching a time where there will be more nurse practitioners uh, practicing in primary care fields than there are physicians practicing in primary care fields. And in my opinion, this has been a wholly good thing, but it is not something that we've really had a national conversation about. Um, and, and there is friction that continues to exist between physicians and nurses on this particular topic. And I'd love to have more conversations about this. So, Howie, let's get to the main course here today. So, there's this question that's floating around medicine. You're a radiologist. Are radiologists going to exist in 10 years? I mean, we've got all this AI and machine learning, and it seems like every day there's, there are advances in pattern recognition and uh, computer vision. Uh, are we going to be needing radiologists in the future? That, that is the big question, and uh, it, it is something that for the last decades, literally you can go back to around the time I think I was born that people started using um, uh, you know, computer-assisted diagnosis of one, one type or another. And that's advanced over the years. And now with AI and machine learning, the ability to help read studies or in some cases actually read imaging studies like CAT scans, chest X-rays, ultrasounds, is becoming more and more of a reality. And so about five years ago, I was asked to write a small piece on this, and I said that I thought it would happen, but it would happen a lot more slowly than people thought. And I think that's been the case. I think we're seeing slow progress made in machine learning AI uh, helping do uh, you know, radiology diagnoses. And from my point of view, clinically right now, this has been a wholly good thing. And, you know, if one day radiologists are not necessary, in my opinion, that would be a great thing. It's not, it's not like we need to employ physicians in one specialty or another. Our goal should be to provide the best care we can to patients at the lowest cost. Um, but I don't see radiologists going away anytime soon. And in fact, there's a shortage of radiologists right now. Uh, and I think some of that is because people have been frightened away by AI. But for me, working with it uh, day, in, day in and day out when I'm in the emergency room, 
it's actually been pretty impressive. Well, okay, so let's unpack a bunch of that stuff because there's so much in, in what you just said. First of all, shortage of radiologists. Isn't that self-imposed? I mean, you guys could double the number of residency slots. I mean, that that's just a matter of creating a market where you guys can make a lot of money and, and there there's a scarcity of of, uh, of talent out there to do the work. So, I mean, that's that. if you worried about that, you could solve that problem tomorrow, right? Aren't, aren't there people you turn away who would be qualified to do radiology? Yeah, I mean, it is always interesting. I talk about this a lot about how do we end up with shortages in medicine? And we've created so many hurdles for somebody to be able to be qualified in any specialty that we do sort of control it, but we also create our own problems. So, if a residency program doesn't expand, if an individual residency program doesn't expand, they're contributing to a shortage. But who's looking over the best interests of the public in terms of how many radiologists we need? Even if Yale were to expand 10 extra slots, for instance, that, that's a minuscule uh, impact. And yet there's no single yeah, body. Would, would the world be better with 10 times as many radiologists? I mean, we have lots of qualified people applying to medical school. You know, and only one in three can get in. And yet we turn away many really great people. And we talked about this before, about the criteria for medical school admission. I mean, there, there are people, especially atypical candidates, we turn away. I mean, this could, maybe I'll just save this for a topic for another day. But this is one thing about the shortage. But the, the other thing is you said that you were in the emergency department. And, and I've always wondered, why is it that you have to be in the emergency department? I mean, why aren't we having sort of centralized radiology farms? I mean, or, or just given the cloud, I mean, why isn't this a gig economy where basically anybody in any time zone can read a, a radiograph? So why do you even have to be in the emergency department? Yeah, and, and we don't. So we have, uh, and, and the pandemic accelerated this, but we don't have to actually be in the emergency room. I'm one of the few people that only reads from within the hospital. There are many people now who read from home, read at their convenience. We have people who have workstations in two locations so that even if they're on vacation, they're available uh, to help out in an emergency. Um, so we do, we have distributed imaging and we currently have sufficiently uh, capable and happy people working night shifts and evening shifts and off hours of one type or another, uh, but we, we're very capable of doing time shifting. We're capable of having somebody read from a remote region. There are regulatory reasons that make it a little more difficult to do that. But yeah, we, but th those regulations were from a different era. I mean, that no one contemplated the current situation. I mean, why doesn't Yale just simply outsource this? Or, or why aren't there just large numbers with high levels of quality control and multiple readings of particular images so that, you know, we, we really bring this into the modern age? I mean, so I think we are. So we um, at Yale, because we have a really pretty large scale, we have around 100 radiologists. At the level of scale that we achieve right now, we're able to have subspecialty reading across the enterprise so that um, we'll, our inpatient and um, outpatient studies will be read by one group. Emergency patients are read by a different group. Uh, specialized neurologic imaging, whether it happens in the emergency room or in the inpatient service or the outpatient service, are read by neuroradiologists, but trauma CTs will be read by trauma radiologists. We've continued to specialize, and we have the scale to be able to have sufficient people on at all times to be able to cover that. Many other places really can't, and what you describe is absolutely beginning to happen where uh, various practices are learning that the only way they could provide the level of quality that they want to provide is to outsource to a, one or another of teleradiology uh, companies. Let, let me ask you now about about this AI thing, because I, I, you know, as I think about it, one of the great things that AI does is pattern recognition. And one of the great applications of it is in what people call high dimensional data, which is the kind of data that's produced by our, our most advanced machines that produce imaging. And, and by the way, the, the data that's being produced by these machines goes beyond what our eyes can perceive. I mean, there's a lot of information that isn't fully captured within two or even three dimensional images. And so the, the computers are able to take into account all this information that's generated. 
and then be able to produce essentially signatures, you know, that, that this is consistent with X, Y, or Z. And, and not just that there's a nodule and, and I think this is, is it slightly bigger or smaller, but actually be able to, with much greater precision, be able to tell us about trends over time and so forth. And, and I liken this, you use this word assisted, you know, instead of replacing, it may be that this is about augmentation of capability. It's about putting the pilot, the radiologist, the still the human being in a position where they're being supported by lots of instrumentation and output in the same way that a pilot in a plane is, and that that makes the, the care, the, the reads, the evaluations much better, higher fidelity, but there still is a human being sort of incorporating this information with the help of, of the computers, but maybe being able to work faster and, and presumably better. I, I see this as coming on really quickly. And I don't know, I think it may be that the radiologist role may be evolving from from just simply a manual process to one that's uh, integrated within a platform that is providing information and then ultimately guidance, right? There, there is this piece about what you've seen, what does it mean and how best can it help that individual patient, which is a complicated uh, thing. But I don't know, what, how quickly do you think it's gonna turn? And, and then what are the implications for training the next generation of radiologists? Yeah, at the moment, what we're seeing is that one of the highest value uses, use cases is for AI to highlight which cases need to be read, read most urgently. So if a patient has had a large vessel occlusion or a patient has had a cervical spine fracture or a pulmonary embolus, having something bring that to the top of the list more quickly, saving even 15 minutes or 30 minutes in the time to diagnosis might have a positive impact on the patient, particularly when it's a reliable uh, system. In addition to that, it's very useful for sort of quality control. Radiologists are human beings. They make mistakes. They make interpretive mistakes. Um, an extra set of eyes has always been of benefit. Uh, it's, it's been proven for decades now that if a second set of radiologists looks at an image, uh, there, there's a higher likelihood of picking up more findings and, and perhaps having an impact on patient care. Well, you, 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 did, a, you did a study of this in the ED, didn't you? I mean, w w just remind me again, what did you find when you looked at that? Didn't you review all those CT scans and see whether there had been something missed? Yeah, over 20 years ago, we found, you know, in, in the single digits, but high single digits were uh, missing significant findings on patients in an emergency room setting. This was sort of early in the evolution of an emergency room uh, tra uh, clinical environment, but something significant, not necessarily management significant, not necessarily changing patient outcomes, but something that you would have liked to have included in the report wasn't included in the report. And that was something we showed a long time ago, and it's still true today that when you're reading studies, more eyes find more findings. Yeah, and I, you know, so that makes sense that that the AI can layer on top and, and be helpful. I, I guess I'm just thinking about the the way that this is going to happen because it's going <laughs> to it's going to collide with the business model for radiology, and and the question sort of is going to be. How is this going to be integrated into practice? And, and then also, what is it going to take for us to have confidence in the kind of output that these models make? It, to, to me, the, re, the, the promise of it is so great because you don't need to find uh, someone with gray hair who's seen a bunch of images in order to ask their opinion. I mean, it means from almost the first day someone's out, they can tap into the wisdom and knowledge that everyone else has had because these systems can get smarter over time just like the first time pilot is in a very strong position because of the instrumentation and the information around them that helps them become as good as the best. We want a radiologist on day one in the job not to say like, well, this is my first day and, and I need to get better over time with more experience, but to be assisted. By the way, this is happening in surgery and a variety of other venues as well. But, but what's it going to take for us to be confident about the output and, what, and how are we going to manage the business model issues that are firmly embedded? I mean, people have expectations of what their job are is and, and how much they're going to make and, 
and the kind of revenue that's generated. I mean, this is quite disruptive. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why, as you point out, people have not been anxious to expand the workforce uh, because you're, the uncertainty of what the future looks like has scared people away from it for a period of time. And so I think the fear for some programs has been if we expand our slots, we're just going to get um, maybe a lower quality uh, medical student applying to our program. And so people have kept it tightly wrapped into the numbers that they have right now. I do think we have a shortage in the short run. And as you know, it takes uh, about seven or eight years between the time somebody gets interested in radiology to the time that they're capable of practicing radiology. And so that alone introduces a substantial lag uh, that we're dealing with right now. People have been scared off by AI, and I think that has contributed somewhat to the shortage. But but some of that's anti competitive. I mean, you can keep, you, we keep making the training programs longer and longer. Presumably this technology might enable us to get someone ready to be a radiologist faster. I, I was just wondering, why did you decide to become a radiologist? I was inspired by the, the sort of fund of knowledge that the radiologists seem to have and their ability to very quickly integrate an image into a clinical picture to make a diagnosis. They always seem to be the ones coming up with the the unusual diagnoses that nobody else was thinking of and pulling that proverbial rabbit out of a hat. Um, but it was also a place where you could, you get to see the use of technology evolving from the moment you enter the career. It never stops. It's always moving very quickly. Do you remember the day that you wanted to become a radiologist? Oh, yes, I do. I met John Leonidas, who is a uh, pediatric radiologist in the neonatal intensive care unit at the Schneider Children's Hospital when I was doing my pediatric rotation and watching him do a head ultrasound on a, a newborn uh, baby and seeing the anatomy laid out on a screen real time with his hands moving that probe uh, in ever so slight angles to show um, the lateral ventricles and the brainstem and so on. I remember just thinking this can't be possible and it just inspired me. And he was also just the brightest and nicest man I ever met in medical school. Hmm. When, when, you, when you see the medical students today, you know, you're mentioning that, that they're considering what the future of radiology is. Are you hearing people express doubts what they consider radiology as a field about whether it'll exist in the future? I think a few years ago I was. There was a lot of fear it was just going to go away. I think what we've seen with AI is that it really is assistive and supportive of being a radiologist. It's not replacing us anytime quickly. And it does continue a trend that has occurred since the beginning of my career and that is our productivity goes up substantially uh, every year. And it's because of the various technologies that surround us that allow us to do that. It's the only field I know about, uh, I'm sure there are others, but where uh, the, the payment that we've gotten over the last 25 years for each thing we do has just gone down over time. Uh, but our salaries haven't gone down. And that's because we're just doing more per unit of time. Do you think radiologists deserve to be the most some of the most highly compensated people in the entire medical profession? You and I have had this conversation before. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I think it's a great field and I spend a lot of time with my undergrads talking about why uh, it ends up being a highly compensated field. But I certainly think that we do not pay our various specialties according to their clinical importance and the effort that goes into it. It's basically paid because of the artifacts of the system that we've built. Yeah, we, we may need some redesign there for everyone, not just for radiology. Well, I, I think that's really interesting. Let me just fi finally... I mean, this isn't meant to be a question and answer for you, but since you're in radiology, do, do you see any downsides, by the way? Do, have you have you noticed any issues with regard to this that you think could lead to unintended adverse consequences? Yeah, I mean, the, the risk is that you become so reliant on it that you're not putting in the effort you should. If it's uh, most of the algorithms we see right now 
augment the accuracy of a radiologist, but it presumes the radiologist is looking as well. If a radiologist were to become lazy and just say, I don't need to look for this because the AI algorithm is so good, it's as good as I was anyway, I don't have to spend time on it, you could, you could have a quality issue there. Even as the algorithms get really good, they're still going to be better by having the extra set of human eyes as well. Well, that's great. Harlan, what's, what's something that inspires you or, or maybe keeps you up at night right now? Maybe the same thing that's been on a lot of people's mind lately, which is, let me just say, Facebook. And, and not just because of Facebook itself, the company, the decisions, the controversies, the whistleblower, but the whole thing, you know, that the idea that we really are going to need to grapple with, the potential benefits and harms of large-scale social networks, power that's concentrated in large companies, and then, and then this outage that occurred that went across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, you know, here, this company that is a technology company that has the geniuses of the world running it. And yet, you know, what, what the heck happened there? You know, that they said it was caused by a faulty configuration change. What, what does that even mean? Can we, can we really get to the root cause of it? Because if Facebook can't keep themselves up, if, if they're going to have outages, and, and by the way, we see outages from time to time with almost every major tech company. So this isn't merely about Facebook, but as our reliance on the cloud and technology grows, you know, I think that we have to be ever more thoughtful about that, what that dependence, what vulnerabilities that dependence creates. So, so it's the whole package. It's the ethical part. It's the regulatory part. It's the technology part. Yeah. It's gotten me thinking a lot about, uh, our reliance and use of these platforms and the ways that they can be optimized for good. And then how are we thinking about the redundancies in the system that are going to protect us so that we can be sure that, that this just doesn't simply happen. You know, our whole monetary systems now are based on electrons moving from place to place. And so society has really in a very rapid uh, uh, period of time come to be in a very different position around these technologies. And anyway, that that's one thing that's, that had my attention this week. What about you, Howie? Is there something that's inspiring you or keeping you up at night lately? Yeah, I've been uh, a little sad or, or disheartened about just watching Congress uh, do the, the Build Back Better legislation. And, you know, it's a reminder, I spent a year working uh, in the Senate, so I'm well aware of the fact that uh, there are two things that you don't want to watch uh, being made. One is a sausage and the other is legislation. And uh, this legislative process can be quite daunting and um, re really break one's soul at times when you see the strength of lobbyists lobbying very hard to dismantle things that they think are against their self-interest. And, you know, specifically watching the pharmaceutical industry lobbying very, very hard about drug pricing legislation for Medicare and watching uh, dentists, among, among others, lobbying against expansion of Medicare for uh, dental care for our elderly and disabled. Um, but the reality is this is what goes on all the time. It's just right now we're seeing it up close and personal and hoping that we actually do get something that uh, bridges the divide and can advance uh, the interests of the people who need help the most. Do you have a solution for that? Uh, I don't think I have a solution for that. I think I'm just in a position of acknowledging that this is the imperfectness of our republic and uh, this is the way we, we function right now. But certainly uh, others have proposed solutions, including um, you know, regulating uh, the moneyed interests in our elections and regulating uh, moneyed interests in Congress, and the, these have generally failed um, on, t to some degree, on First Amendment grounds. Yeah, I'll just say that the thing about it that bothers me is I, I see sort of an, an inexorable uh, journey towards more fragmentation and more confrontation. And with an ex if an external threat like a like a pandemic can't bring us together, I'm I'm not sure what will. And most great societies fail by internal problems rather than external problems, or, or many do. And I worry about that for us. So we, we need to continue to be a constructive force for good. But yeah, it's, it's disheartening. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? 
To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at, at HMK Yale. And I'm at the Howie. That's T H E H O W I E. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon.